when we meditate, we're stepping out of the world. As the Buddha says, you keep track of the body in and of itself, or feelings, or mind, or mental qualities, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. The in and of itself there is important. So you're going to focus on the breath. It's just the breath right here. That's the aspect of the body you're going to focus on. And everything else related to the body as it functions in the world, you just put it aside. You don't have to worry about how you look to other people, whether your body is strong enough to do the work you want, how old it's getting. Simply the sense of the breath is coming in and going out, which is the same for everybody, as you get focused on the breath in and of itself. And as you're stepping out of the world, you're also stepping out of yourself in the world. The you in here is just your awareness and the thoughts that you use to keep with the breath. And that's the only part of you that's relevant. That the you as you function in the world, you can put that aside. In this way we all have common ground. Because right now what we're experiencing is the body from the inside. Our awareness as it relates to the body and the breath, as it gives rise to feelings of either pleasure or pain. You try to breathe in such a way so that it's more pleasant. So you've got body, feelings, mind, three of the frames of reference all there. That's it. That's your world for the moment. That's you for the moment. And it's from this perspective that we look at our minds. We get to step out of our normal thought patterns and get a grounding here. And this ground is common ground. It's what we all have in common. The little details may be different. But this is where we all come to. I noticed when I was studying with John Fuang, as he was teaching people breath meditation, different people would come and have all kinds of different problems. Sometimes it seemed like he was hurting cats. It's as if we're all going to one spot, but some of us are coming from the north, some are coming from the south, some from the east, some of the west. But there came a point in meditation where if you got to the point where your awareness is filling the body, the breath was getting more and more calm, more and more refined, to the point where it actually stopped. Then from that point on, everybody's meditation was the same. They went through the same steps. There was a common structure to the mind. And to get to this point may require different techniques, different strategies for different people, but we get finally to that one point where it's all the same. And John Fuhr once said that John Munda made the comment that we're all the same, but we're not the same. But then when you come right down to it, we are the same. In other words, we all want happiness. We're all suffering. The details of the kind of happiness we think we want and the details of the way we suffer, those are different. But you get down to the common structure and it's all the same. After all, what do the Four Noble Truths teach us? They teach us that the reason we're suffering is not because of things outside, because of habits we have in the mind, the habits that made us get born to begin with, our craving and our clinging. And so to solve the problem, we all have to turn inside. And all craving and clinging may be different for different people because we crave different things and cling to different things. The actual processes are all the same. The clinging goes to the five aggregates, and everybody has five aggregates. The form of the body, feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness. These we have in common. And the ways we cling. We cling through sensuality, through our habits and practices, views about the world, and ideas of who we are. 
and all of the views and the ideas of who we are and our habits and practices and the particularity of our ideas of what sensual pleasures we want may be different. The general outline is all the same, and the basic tools are all the same, which means we have common ground. And notice that staying in what Dhamma said it, by the John Fuang students, we came from all different kinds of backgrounds. But the fact that we had something in common in our practice meant the different backgrounds were nothing threatening, nothing alienating. In fact, they were interesting because we did have this common ground in the practice. It was like learning different ways of being a human being. And you think about the teaching on rebirth. You see somebody, you've been there before. Whatever they are now, you've been there at some point. So nobody's alien, nobody's stranger. Somebody at this time around, we each dealt a different hand of cards, and it's interesting to see what cards the other people have, what perspective they're coming from different insights on what it's like to be a human being. And we could share our, our stories about how we found we had problems with meditation. I, as a Westerner, felt that I was disadvantaged in the sense that I had to start from scratch. Everything about Buddhism was foreign. But then I discovered there are some ways in which it was an advantage. A lot of people grew up with parents who had told them all kinds of strange things about what the Buddha taught. They had to clear those misunderstandings away. I had to clear my misunderstandings away. But we had this common ground that made the other person's misunderstandings and background really interesting. So this is what the Dharma stresses. We all have something in common. We're all suffering, and we're all suffering in basically the same ways. And we can help one another along wherever our particular problems in getting the mind into this common ground are similar, or sometimes when they're different. That gives you a new perspective on what your problems are. So we focus on the common ground, and that way we can get out of ourselves and get out of our worlds. Because it's in the process of creating a self in a particular world of experience that we suffer. That's called becoming. And the Buddha says all the cravings that lead to becoming are going to make you suffer, whether sensual cravings or craving for becoming or craving for even for non-becoming, when you want to destroy a particular becoming. That too leads to becoming. So the basic structure is all the same. And we take on the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha is telling us to step out, both as part of the path to begin with, to learn to look at experience not in terms of who you are or what the world is like, but simply what are the processes that are going on in the mind, going on inside the body, that are giving rise to suffering. Can you do that not in ignorance, which is going to cause suffering, but can you do it with knowledge? That's one way in which we step out. And then finally, when the path leads us to something timeless, something deathless, you really step out. You actually step out of space and time entirely. In doing so, you see that it's true that your engagement with space and time didn't start with the day you were born in this lifetime. You may not know the details of the previous lifetimes, but you have this sense of time going way back. And now you're out. That, too, is common ground for everybody who reaches the end of the path. So as we focus on what we have in common, we can pull ourselves out of the particulars of our suffering. And the freedom that results is the same for everyone. <laughs>